Welcome to Linking Into Sales. This is Martin Brossman. And Greg Heyer. And Elise Archer. We're excited to have a special show that was pre-recorded. I recorded it with Dr. Brian Lambert. Very excited about this because I got to work with him on a project a number of years ago with the intention of making sales a profession like lawyer, doctor, a, a accountant, CPA. He worked a number of years on it. So he's looking in retrospect over 15 years of sales. And now he's a cutting edge consultant on sales, a sales management all aspects of it and marketing. And I'm really excited for us to uh, we'll review it, see the show, and then we're going to comment on it after the show. Greg? Uh, why don't we just uh, take a moment and let's go right to the show. Hello, this is Martin Brossman, and I'm here with Dr. Brian Lambert and a good longtime friend of over 15 years, I yeah, believe. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for having me. And uh, he's in town, and I hijacked him from the hotel. <laughs> I took him out to dinner, but I still got you to pay for it. So That's I'm, right. I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, right? how did that work? <laughs> <laughs> we met uh, 50, about 15 years ago yeah. in a project that was intended to create sales as a distinct profession. That's right. And it was so exciting to be part of. And you've been actively a consultant in sales all along. And I thought it, today's would be a journey in where was sales then? What were we doing back then? Why, why make it a profession? Where we are now and where you see we're going. And okay. I thought that's what our journey today is. And, and he's been willing to, since I drove him here, he knows he can't get back to his hotel without giving that's us right. a show. That's right. right. Yeah, and I'm excited to be here. I think uh, back in 2001, when I started that project, it was really a, a, an association for salespeople. And I had this idea of, you know, there's so much sales training content out there, but it's locked up in these sales training companies that uh, it was really unaccessible to me as a seller. I couldn't couldn't really get my hands on it. And the training teams that I had didn't really support me in it. And I, you know, and I had to spend my own money in my own professional development. And I think back then I did a research and I asked people, I said, how much money do you spend on your own professional development? And back then in 2001, 2002, it was about $2,000 a year. Which is a lot. I think it's a lot. Yeah. And I think it's great. And I, I, my guess is that's continuing today. But if you look at what people are studying and uh, what they're investing their time to learn, boy, is it radically different than it was back then. Yeah. So the th where I met you, I just want to flash a piece of nostalgia <laughs> yeah, and we'll put an image, we'll put an image for the podcasters to see. And it's the compendium of professional selling. And you and Eric were ambitiously taking on what would it take to make sales a profession just like the uh, the latest model we had was project managers, right? Yeah. So if you think of yeah, project management, really didn't really didn't have a profession, you know, 20, 30 years before uh, their certification process with the PMP. Uh, and I was looking at that saying, okay, well, that was probably the last time that a, a profession got created from scratch. Why hasn't selling be, become professionalized like that? And if you think about it, like uh, bookkeepers, if you think of Uncle Scrooge and, mm -hmm. and how uh, bookkeeping was, you know, you count the beans and you just crunch the numbers. And now it, it moved into accounting and now it's into finance and CFOs and really look at the evolution of that profession, it's quite dramatic. And CPAs. Yeah, and CPAs. And, and, you, and I think selling has an equal role to play in the, in the life of commerce and making sure that businesses grow and that people grow. And I just thought it was important to bring knowledge, bring training, bring skills, and even bring certification to people uh, to help them be successful. Obviously, you need a lot of funding to do that. <laughs> Um, but in, in it really didn't make it further than uh, a couple of countries and a couple thousand people. Yeah. But I, I had and I had to pull the plug on it. But it was mm -hmm. a one of those things where at the moment uh, I, I I really signed up for making salespeople successful one person at a time. Yeah. And I still hold that true today. And that was really my choice to work on the profession of selling, not just in it. Mm -hmm. And I remember quitting my sales job. I was a number two performer in a Fortune 500 company, and I went to go work on the sales profession. Now now that's moved into what's called sales enablement. If you look at that uh, phrase out there, if you Bing that or Google that, you'll see you know there's 100,000 know, of people uh, talking about sales enablement. Uh, but five years ago, that really didn't even exist. So we're seeing a, a rapid explosion on helping salespeople be successful. Uh, and I still carry a lot with what's in here uh, in, in that book uh, forward, uh, making sure you understand how people buy, uh, understanding how people make decisions, giving them the right information at the right time, 
uh, helping uh, make a, a sound business decision based on value, not just on selling a widget, for example. And that was all in there. And I gave that book away for free. And maybe that's why I'm not, you know, wasn't successful. Yeah, right. The sales guy giving <laughs> stuff away for free. But we uh, got it printed with a nice graphic <laughs> at least for you, right? That was done right. in, in, locally, in fact. Yeah, that's great. Uh, why make it a profession? Because that was one I asked Elise that's on our team, give me at least one question. She goes, why would we need it? Why, why the value? Why make an effort to do it? You know. Uh, yeah, that's why, a good question. What, what's the intention of, of that? Yeah, I think, and, and now if you look at where things are, sales would probably never become fully recognized as a professional uh, type of organization, type of profession with, with certification and all that. And I think it's probably because buyers and customers don't really demand it. Uh, I think individuals want to do well. Um, and they want to invest in themselves, but really for authority, uh, influence to come, it really has to come from customers and come from buyers. And that's really, really where professionalism comes from. You don't just say, I'm certified, here's my stuff on the wall, I'm now credible. Really that credibility comes from somebody giving it to you, uh, your customers giving that to you, and they don't really care if you're certified or not. Uh, I think they wanna make sure that you're you're able to uh, help connect the dots in the sales conversation, that you're able to communicate value the right way, and that you're able to help them move forward in their decision-making process, whether you're certified or not. And I think uh, it's really about the personal uh, aspect of that now, and it's really about the idea of continuing to evolve in a relationship that truly makes people successful. Uh, and again, you don't really need to be certified for that at all. So uh, because it's so value-driven, so results-focused, so uh, value, you know, um, beyond just an individual conversation to impacting a company or an organization, uh, it's really about making sure you're influential in that. And again, you don't really need to be certified for that. The proof's in the pudding, so to speak. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you can help navigate the customer's journey, then that's going to be the reward. Is when you get that that uh, signed agreement, whether you have credentials or certification after your name or letters after, it doesn't matter. So I think that's why. One of the things that I really liked is you. I mean, this is 15 years ago. You were talking about uh, taking away the sales funnel back then, well, because yeah. that was the thing, and really the sales cycle. And yeah. that's partnering up the process with marketing and sales in partnership with the journey of the customer. That's a lot like the customer journey we're talking about today. Yeah. And to me, some of those fundamentals is what we were teaching. I was, I was honored to be one of the certified uh, certified and registered sales professionals with it and was the head of education for the triangle. And that's what I was so passionate about is this looks like more like a journey with the customer yeah. 15 years ago. Right. Yeah. And I think um, maybe it was ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at the evolution of how people buy uh, today, uh, really back, back a hundred years ago, no product knowledge existed on the internet. It was really, brought forward through the selling interaction and the conversation. If you think about the idea of a sewing machine uh, and bringing that sewing machine onto a, a farm, a homestead out in the, in the Western United States, you know, somebody has to come communicate the, 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 uh, the reason why you want to do uh, some sort of machine or use some sort of machine instead of hand sewing. And that had to be a salesperson. But if in the, in the eighties and nineties, the idea of the internet, you know, started taking off in 2000, um, and really looking at the idea of putting all that product knowledge on the internet. And that took away a lot of selling uh, influence when you don't have to be a walking brochure. And if you look at how people buy now in communities, uh, getting information off the internet through um, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, understanding more about the company selling to them and the person than ever before. Uh, if you're a walking brochure, you're not going to have a job. If the if the website that that you have as a company can ar articulate value better than you, you're not going to have a job. So if you have to keep up with how buying evolves. And and back then it was really about understanding how people buy. Um, today it's more about understanding how people solve problems and uh, understanding the, the actual impact of that. And that's what that book was about, was just trying to get into, well, what does happen and how do people make decisions in their buying process? 
And then we moved to, of course, what was called the first Web 2.0. And now our term's really social selling that we've mm-hmm. evolved to yeah. of using all the resources that are available and really understanding that the customer has done more research than ever before, before you meet them. It's not all good. It's not all bad. Right. But if you aren't creating some of this content, it's probably not going to be serving you. Right. Yeah. And I think about um, the idea of being influential and just that, that one word alone has really, really evolved in the last 20 years, as I just mentioned and being influential today it's interesting because influence is about your presence. It's about um, what you're saying, who you're saying it to, and, and how many of your people uh, are you helping. Mm-hmm. And uh, that type of influence at scale, if you will, is the same type of influence you had back in the homesteading example in the late 1800s. It's that same type of influence. But with social media, you can have that type of influence in the thousands or tens of thousands of people, if, if you will, if you have a point of view. And I think that's really where the idea of um, perhaps, uh, you know, confronting a customer or challenging a customer has really come into play. But I I would submit that you have to have some insight. You have to have a point of view. And where are you getting that point of view from? And what are you able to articulate in the relationship? That's really key today. You can't just walk up to somebody and challenge them. Mm -hmm. Or you can't just walk up to somebody and provoke them to buy. But if you can say, listen, uh, uh, my... Of across all my inputs, this is what I'm seeing. What do you think? Yeah. And I think sellers today are underestimating the power of the input side of social media. They look at, well, gee, it's noisy and they have a lot of you know noise out there and I have to sort through that. But if you are able to sort through tens of thousands of inputs in the right way and look for trends, you can maybe connect the dots for a customer that they hadn't thought of before. So that's important, I think, to a seller today. And if you look at how buying has evolved and problems need to get solved and and decisions need to be made about vendors and how people choose to allocate their time, uh, where, where in the ways in which they are more sophisticated and, and how they make decisions with teams and who's on those teams. And then more importantly, even how uh, information gets exchanged. It's not just you know, over the internet, like a, like a, a email, it's now over communities of, of uh, insightful people sharing bite-sized nuggets of quick time information, real time. And uh, that's, that's a hard thing to grasp in our, you know, human brain, how much information can be flying around at once. So sellers are in a unique position to kind of cut through the noise, in my opinion. What do you see are some of the biggest challenges today, both for the customers in the B2B sales world and the salespeople? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it, um, you know, if you have a million sound bites out there, how do you prioritize and how do you sort through who truly has uh, an information piece or some sort of insight that you might need? Um, if you are listening to everything uh, and take it all at equal value, um, then then that could get overwhelming. So it's the idea of having this uh, multiple input sources, but prioritizing based on your background, but also more importantly, your uh, way of you're framing up the world. And I think that happens on both sides. On the seller side, if I have millions of inputs, I have to prioritize in order to connect the dots for my customers. On the, on the customer side, on the buying side, I'm going to have inputs not only from you know, sell, salespeople and marketing messages, I'm going to have inputs from my own team. I'm going to have inputs from my, my previous, uh, you know, you know uh, relationships with the, the, uh, the, cus- the company. And I'm going to have uh, people really trying to tackle different issues. And I have to listen to all them too. So I've got internal and external and, uh, and it's, it's hard on both sides to prioritize and kind of sync up. And I think that's the real, the real dance today is, is being able to enter into somebody's problem solving cycle as a customer um, in their journey, making sure they understand the whole totality of the the buying decision on the selling side, entering into that that decision making process and giving people what they need along the way to make decisions. And that's really the challenges in selling today. And what do you think? We've got uh, more and more machine learning tools that are coming out, more and more uh, tools like like we we use, um, Nimble that I, that I talked about, mm-hmm. uh, and we interviewed the founder of Nimble, where you, it's like a Rolodex. You put in the name, and it's out there looking for data for you. Mm-hmm. So there's, I think we're seeing a, more of a hybrid tools, you know, yeah. that are coming in. And what's your view on it? Because 
uh, that most people are overwhelmed in learning already. Right. And so even if it's a great tool, it doesn't mean they're always adopting it. So what do you see <laughs> the next frontier? The, the, you know, what does the salesperson have to, to do to survive in this world? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I asked you four questions. Just <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer them all. Yeah, right. In the right order. Yeah. So um, what was the question? No, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> but yeah, it's an interesting uh, conundrum, right? Because uh, in order to be successful, you have to obviously close close revenue um, and when you look at how you need to do that today there are a lot of tools and I actually got uh, an infographic sent to me uh, by somebody and they tweeted it to me but if you look up sales enablement tools out there you know they crammed all the technologies on one thumbnail infographic and you can't even read any of it but there's 100 200 300 maybe even a thousand logos on there and they all started in the last two and a half years with VC, whatever. And you're like, I can't keep up with all that. Forget it. Um, so the application of technology to specific selling challenges is really what I would encourage salespeople to focus in on. So, okay, great. I have a problem closing deals. But that's the aggregate, you know, almost the, the, the lagging indicator of a bigger problem. Um, maybe you're having trouble creating a shared vision of success. Well, what, is, what tool is going to help you create a shared vision with a customer? You have a vision for where they need to go. What tools can you leverage? And, and the use of, of sales enablement tools in that regard is completely different than a problem maybe uh, filling the top of the funnel where you need to get access to executive decision makers. And if you say, well, I can't get in front of executive decision makers in my target market, what tools can I use to fill the top of the funnel? That's a completely different set of tools all of a sudden. And I don't think there is one tool that goes across all of the selling problems that sellers are gonna have. If you've got trouble managing information, there's tools for that. If there's trouble managing time, there's tools for that. So I think it's really coming down to understanding your own strengths and weaknesses. And as salespeople, we're getting immediate feedback, but I think sometimes we think we've got it all under control. We've got to admit what we don't know and what we're, what we're maybe a little bit weak on, and then ask around and say, hey, I'm having trouble with X, Y, or Z. And I, like I talked to you, I said, I'm having trouble you know, bringing together all of the, the feeds into one spot, you know, and you gave me tools that yeah. I can, I can think about bringing different feeds right. and different social profiles yeah. into one spot. That's an example of a need. Uh, I might have trouble um, maybe uh, listening, you know, uh, to the, to this blogosphere, to, to what's happening. The Twittersphere. The Twittersphere. We talked about uh, it. Then, you know, right? and how do I, how do I set up lists and yeah. prioritize some of this so that I'm listening in the right way? That was a problem or else I won't listen at all. Right. And I think, um, you know, there's a phenomenon of, you know, if you take out your phone and you look at your apps and you look at your news sources, we're so used to going back to the same sources of inputs all the time. Well, when you do that, people don't realize that that you actually end up sounding like that. And that becomes your point of view. And I think uh, what social selling can do is help people broaden their perspective. So start with the problem you're having. You know, understand where you're stuck in the sales process. Be really super specific because most of these tools are very point solution oriented. There is no one silver bullet for all of social selling. Right. No, that's great. And also, I just think one of the values is uh, good old networking where you, you trade tips, you know, yeah. where like you showed me a few uh, tips and apps that could be helpful and I did the same. Uh, building that kind of sales team, it may not be in the business. It may be your coworkers are yeah. too competitive. You need to yeah. have buddies or uh, contacts elsewhere to keep up with it. That's I mean, a good I, point. Like I, I said, hey, have you heard of? Yeah. And you're like, no, I haven't heard of yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. And you're like, have you heard of that? I'm like, no, I haven't heard of that. So uh, I think that's an important aspect that you're bringing up is there is a human side um, uh, of this whole thing. And, and I think we can isolate. Uh, we can be in our phones and we can have our virtual reality device right. on or whatever. And uh, we're not thinking about the, the connections of people and, and how others might help us be successful. And, and I think that's an important aspect is bringing the, the what did you, you say earlier, bringing social, it's called social media, not yeah. broadcast right. media. Yeah, that, by Martin Brock. <laughs> <laughs> but, and that's, that's a very important piece because what happens is, in my experience is we get so overwhelmed with stimulation, we start rutting very quickly. Yeah. We get stuck in rut. And, and so you, some of that you need for survival, but you also need to have some people pulling you out of it. Yeah, so, so a continuous learning aspect. I used to know a Navy fighter pilot 
Uh, I still know him, actually. <laughs> he's still here. <laughs> right, good. But a uh, Navy fighter pilot who said, you know, if you ever watched the Blue Angel debrief, and these are the guys that, that fly the airplanes and do all the air shows, and, and if you watch their debriefing, they point out everything that's a, a weakness, a, a, a spot they didn't understand. Uh, maybe they called the wrong call sign. They were in, you know, they were one millimeter off in the flying formation. They will notice all those things, and they purposefully – debrief it together and say, this is what I saw. This was my issue. I'm going to own that. And I think salespeople don't take enough time to actually di dissect what's going well and what's not going well in their own sales process. And they're too quick to blame others. So I don't have this. I don't have that. You know, a lot of the reason why you're here, even in, on this, this podcast and on this video is to say that you figured out a lot of this stuff your own. It's not, it's not like you just had it given to you. You had to roll up your sleeves and, and you had to learn on the yep. job so to speak. And I think most sellers have to, to learn now. They have to learn how to learn uh, in the world that we live in. And if they don't, they're going to be obsolete. This is a continuous learning profession. And that's why I, I also like social is it points out things that I hadn't thought of before. It makes connections that may, maybe I think are weird at, at the time. But then three days later, I'm like, that is a good connection. But it gives me new inputs and it helps me continuously learn. What about the idea of AI is going to replace the salesperson? We don't need them anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Well, first they have to be replaced in uh, transactional sales uh -huh. right. <laughs> and uh, that's making progress. But, you know, in the big scheme of things, uh, if you're selling high, high end solutions to multiple decision makers all over the globe yeah. and, you know, that'll ne that's never going to be an AI thing, in my opinion. But if you look at, you know, uh, maybe an energy drink or, yeah. you know, buying uh, a license on the Internet for software and, yeah. And, and maybe even downloading the, the software over the web. Absolutely, you don't need salespeople for that. You don't want to. You don't want to have that expensive resource because salespeople are expensive. You don't want to support them if you're if they're trying to sell something transactional. Why not move it all to the web? But at the same time, ask your salespeople to move into uh, those types of roles that require an interpersonal connection, because a lot of buying still requires a seller to whiteboard. Mm -hmm. a, a seller to help them process information, a seller to bring in highly structured visions, uh, whether they're uh, on a conceptual model written, you know, in a picture or into a Gantt chart over three years. You know, salespeople have to be able to do that if, or even selling the, the roadmap of technology. Uh, you can't just do that over the web, especially in the, in the idea of making it relatable to the customer's role and their actual job. Uh, that can't really be on the internet. Now, AI, you know, might be able to do something like that, but it's interesting. It requires both sides of the conversation to be equally understood. Mm -hmm. The buying side and the selling side have to be put into bits and bytes and ones and zeros. And I think that's the bigger issue. Um, so I won't say never AI will happen on, but it, for it to really occur, you've got to be equally as intelligent about the buying side as the selling side and have those points intersect uh, with individuals or not not individuals at the right altitude level with the same level of complexity, et cetera. It's uh, pretty hard to do with people, let alone with uh, ones and zeros. What do you see as the most important thing that uh, sales professionals need to start focusing on today in this extremely rapidly changing world? I, I When we teach social media management, I say it's like an island with random earthquakes changing its terrain all the time. Yeah. You can't control the ocean. You can just learn to surf. Yeah. So what, what would be your, because you probably see some patterns where they got to start doing yeah. X or something. They've got to start, uh, and it sounds cliche, but uh, when, you, when I say this, think about it, um, they've really got to understand their customer. And the reason why I say that is if you think about this idea of the evolution of customers, and if you just think about your own individual consumerism and how that's rapidly evolved in the last five to seven years. I mean, iPhones weren't even around. Can you believe it? Yeah. You know, right. um, and just think about how rapidly we are changing our buying behaviors. We buy cars on the Internet now. We, we, their largest retailer is Amazon. They don't even have a store. It's like drones are showing up on my, my, my daughter bought a riding helmet yeah. at nine o'clock in the morning. It was fuchsia right. nine o'clock in the morning. A, a, she rides horses, nine year old riding helmet, fuchsia colored helmet shows up. She ordered it at nine. It showed up at 12 wow. on my front front. And I live in a suburb. 
right, outside right, of DC. Right. So buying now has really, really evolved. So any seller that says, I'm going to focus on any everything else and not my customer yeah. is really missing the boat because every company I go into, whether it's Microsoft, HP, American Express, Macy's, um, even you know companies that are regional, um, there is a company called Sheets, and they they're moving from a gas right. station. Yeah, uh, and they have food inside. We got a lot of them. Yeah, we got a lot yeah. of them here. Yeah. But they they want to be a restaurant. I mean, they're 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 right. a restaurant with gas pumps outside. Right. That's right? it. So um, if you think about what that does to buying behavior yeah. of the gas station sure. now, it's an experience, much like Starbucks or whatever. Right. So there's a lot of evolution on the buying side. And I think some of the to be successful today, you've got to understand your customer. You really have to immerse in that. And you have to use customers as a way to simplify all this stuff. If you can't simplify around your customers, you'll never be successful because you'll always find something else to simplify around my nine to five work life balance or um, my my way in which I view my solution or perhaps my product knowledge. If you're organizing around any of those things and not your customer, you're not going to be successful in selling today. And and customers have evolved. You know, I, I like to give a test, you know, who is your target market? Who, who do you sell to? You know, tell me about their role. What kind of altitude level? OK, got it. Great. Um, now, can you talk to me for the next three hours? about that person without ever mentioning your product. Yeah. Can you spend three hours? And people look at me like I'm crazy. Okay, well first off, how long do you think those customers spend talking about their problems without ever mentioning your product? Right. 80 hours a week. Right. You can't even give me three. Okay, how about, how about 10 minutes? Can you spend 10 minutes talking about your customer without your products? I do this on stage all the way around, all around the world. Cool. I bring a hundred bucks, a hundred dollars. Uh, anybody want to walk up here and tell me about your solution or tell me about I need to come to your class. I can yeah, do that. And never, and never mention your solution. Just tell yeah. me about your customer yeah. for, for 10 minutes. I'll give you a hundred bucks. Yeah. And I always have somebody take me up and the longest they can make it before the audience buzzes them is about a minute and a half. Wow. So you have a minute and a half of customer empathy, right. of customer understanding, customer problem solving against their 80 hours a week of problem solving and you're going to tell me you're going to be successful in whatever you want to call it gaining access selling the closing the sale you know being a solution seller being a challenger whatever absolutely not i will hands down uh, tell you you're crazy that mm -hmm. you're actually smoking crack yeah because uh, it's not going to happen and and i've invested my time to figure out how i can talk to customers for two to three hours yeah without ever mentioning what I do and only focus on their problem. And, and that that blows away most customers to have yeah. that much empathy for what they're really truly facing today. So get back to your customers, stay focused on them and become an expert. Uh, anything else you do is ridiculous today. Uh, that's the only, in my opinion, only way to simplify is to uh, simplify around your customer. So really building the personas, crawling into the world, seeing through their eyes. Yeah. Better what's than their, they see. Better almost, than they right? see. Yeah. I mean, what's their calendar? Their model of reality. Yeah. What do they do beyond just your work? Yeah. What is, what's a day in the life look like? Yeah. And I've, I've asked people, I said, hey, can you take a screenshot of your calendar? Yeah. And why? Do, why? Well, because I'd like to go over it with you. Well, what yeah. are you talking about? Right. Well, I just want to understand who you're meeting with and all that. Yeah. Well, I'm not. Well, look at your calendar. Is there any public information on there that right. Right. it says be so and so? I'm not going to, you know. Right. Right. Okay, so we go over their calendar and they find it very illuminating to, to actually process their day with me. Yeah. Or to actually, in, you know, engage in a conversation where I've defined what I consider to be five to seven key problems for their role. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, and helping them with and, and just say, hey, are these right? Uh, these are trends I'm seeing. What about you, customer? Yeah. And they, they want to spend a lot of time be telling me I'm wrong. And that's great. I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. Because they're helping me learn. So I think putting yourself out there into that, uh, you know, kind of gorillas in the mist type of view where yeah. you're going to go sit out there in the forest and you're going to see how people eat, how they, you know, communicate, who they're talking to, how they manage their day, how they make decisions under the, and, and the stress that they're under, quite frankly. I mean, it's hot. Most salespeople in complex selling don't really, really, really have an understanding of the amount of stress in today's buying environment. Um, the customer goes the through. Customer You're right going because through. they've got they got to live with those people. Yeah, the team they made the decision. Yeah, on. They and, got and also with the rat, there's all these all these business models are changing. Yeah, um, the the work is different. Most people, most customers, their job title has absolutely nothing to do with their real job anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the way in which their department is structured is irrelevant today. 
Um, the way in which they actually make decisions is, is driven by the initiatives they're working on and the, the outcomes they're trying to drive. And if you don't understand the outcomes and what they're working on, how are you going to help them be successful? Most sellers can't talk to that. So it's highly stressful. I know customers that are basically in eight hours uh, of meetings back to back, they can't even go to the bathroom. I know people have gotten kidney infections because they can't go to the bathroom because wow. uh, their work environment is so stressful. Yeah. And you would know this company too right, if I right, told you. Right, right, right. And it's because they're, they're trying to work. I, I do, don't mention it. <laughs> yeah, they're trying to work in new ways, yeah. uh, applying uh, legacy old thinking, which mm -hmm. is a whole other whole yeah. other podcast, I'm sure. Yeah. But the, po the bottom line is understand who they are, understand their role, be able to be empathetic with them, and uh, really put yourself, go beyond just putting yourself in your shoes, literally put yourself in their shoes, yeah. and become an advocate for them. Don't just try to sell to them. Really, really try to help them be successful. That's great. What a great tone to, you know, what are you excited about for the future? And then we'll wrap it up. Oh boy. I'm now get to play crystal. crystal yeah. Crystal ball here. ball here. Yeah. Well, the future is what? Three weeks from now. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's hard to say. It's, it. This whole thing is moving so fast. I think, um, where if I, if so to think about selling and where it's going, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, new ways in which selling can add value. You know, I, I would never have thought, you know, uh, anything would move past email. Right. Um, so, and you're yeah, using Slack on your phone. I'm using my, right. yeah, Slack is awesome. Right. Right. You know, uh, the idea of sending something of value to a customer um, and producing some sort of new content for them as a seller right. uh, was unheard of because of all the marketing lockdowns back then. But now you can do that um, and you can start becoming what I call a, a value creator uh, and a value producer not just somebody who consumes value from others. And you have to be able to create net new value for others. And that's really what I'm excited about is to see salespeople take an idea of maybe a new business model or even a, a new conceptual model of how their solution might work. Visually representing that, taking a picture of it, going back to somebody on Fiverr or something and saying, hey, can you make a picture of this for me? Having them whip that out and the next day saying, hey customer, I don't know if this is right, but this is how I think about it. And it's somewhat polished, but who cares? It's not right. fully polished. It's got the brand colors and we got our logo on there. So yeah, what do you, you know, think? Yeah, but what do you think, Mr. Customer? And that type of collaboration, while the marketing folks might be falling out of their chair right now, <laughs> this is what this is where customers need the help. Yeah. They need that type of help on I, I call it um, not just getting not just figure you know, not just getting stuff done. Um, that they don't need that kind of help. The, the getting stuff done is actually uh, somewhat easy for for buyers today, uh, even though it's highly complex and stresses them out. What they really need help on is figuring stuff out. Mm -hmm. There's a complete difference from getting stuff done to figuring stuff out and helping mo moving into that world where sellers are truly helping figure out new problems. Uh, that's where selling needs to go. And it sounds like you know well that's what we've been doing for 150 years, but we haven't been doing it this way. Yeah. Uh, and this idea of a of a knowledge economy, the conceptual age that we live in, uh, you're talking about a lot of white space activities, um, not just you know looking at business processes, for example. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be innovative in new ways. And I think that's exciting for salespeople mm -hmm. if they can embrace that and even understand what the heck I just said. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. uh, well uh, where can they learn more about you? So we make sure uh, get, I'm at uh, uh, oxygenlearning.com slash blog. And I'm also uh -huh. at uh, Dr. Brian Lambert Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. And I've got my LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, I'm on a, a lot of speaking uh, engagements. So hopefully, I can see folks around. And you're here in Raleigh giving a talk. Yeah, here in Raleigh. Yeah, I'll be in Buenos Aires, Argentina this Excellent. week in, in Raleigh. So, you know, I've got them all covered. Yeah, right. Uh, but I'm, I'm also working on a new book idea around just this idea of the shifting world of work and how people have to, to really embrace that new. Uh, value creation aspect. Mm -hmm. So dynamically. Yeah, dynamically. On the fly. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Greg Heyer and Elise Archer weren't uh, able to collaborate on our short notice of me kidnapping you here. Sure. So we're going to have some comments from them and engagement as well. This was just fantastic. Thanks for thank you for having it. We look forward to having some more. We might do a blab together and, yeah, and or uh, come up to visit in DC and okay. have some more. So thanks, excellent. Martin. Excellent. All Thanks right. very much. Bye, everybody. How'd you like it? That was pretty darn good. Yeah, good, good. Elise, yeah. did you enjoy that? I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> it, was, awesome. it was so fun. I heard Brian was coming to town. I took him hostage, dragging him over to my home studio, 
and we got the show recorded. Uh, he's so popular. There are a lot of people I'm sure wanted to meet him as well, but I thought we'd comment a little bit on this. And I'm going to open with one of the things that I love the most is his challenge to salespeople of, can you talk for a long period of time about your customer's world? so that you fully immersed yourself in it. So you could really just talk about them for a while. And, and I remember thinking, especially with the small businesses I've worked with over the years, I could probably talk for an hour or so about their world and their challenges and their joys and their why they got into it. And I, that was something that grabbed me right off the bat. Over to you guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's such a, an important viewpoint. And it seems like it should almost be a requirement for somebody when they're coming into a new sales role to literally sit there and just spend as much time as you can just either writing it out or speaking out like, what is my customer feeling? What's their world like? And I think he's absolutely right that he said, what, most people probably can't do it for more than two or three minutes without mm -hmm. mentioning their product or service. I mean, I might be guilty of that as well. It really got me thinking. Such an important viewpoint. Exactly. I, I think that, that almost, uh, I, I know he's been working on it for a number of years, but it almost, it almost reminds me of this uh, the talk that Simon Sinek did, uh, uh, the TED Talk that he did back in 2012 about uh, how leaders inspire and how he talks about the golden circle. And, and it's important to start Oh, at least you know, from, from some of the research that he had done, he had pointed out that if you start with why, there's a better chance of you making a connection with somebody, right? He really realized that maybe that project to make sales a profession uh, was a little ahead of its time. And also, its time won't come until the customers need it and demand it. The, the world of project managers is what we pattern the whole United Professional Sales Association project after. And that was because project management came into the field as a profession. And Brian and Eric as well, had, as well as many people that helped them, had participated in what did it take to make something a real profession and let's take on doing it. So it's so exciting to be part of something something with that intention, even if it doesn't work out at the time. And I learned so much. I, I was, uh, my role was the head of education with it. And I'm, I am a United Professional Sales Associated Certified and Registered Sales Professional. I still have it on my LinkedIn. But uh, the existence of something like this, is it time? Will it be time in the future? I thought he was really candid on that. Well, I guess the question that comes to mind is, you know, as more and more of what salespeople do gets replaced with online search, which is clearly why we have this entire podcast, is that more likely to happen? More likely to be, to be designated as certified sales professionals down the road? Or is that less likely to happen as some jobs become obsolete? And I don't know, I can see it going either way where it gets to the point where uh, the job of a sales professional becomes basically you have to be so talented and so skilled because so much of what uh, you know, a regular sales professional could do is just replace with online search where all of a sudden you do have to become certified in this way or maybe you know, the profession of sales really does become obsolete down the road. I don't know that it ever will, but I can see it going either way and I was curious to get you I think you, you know, that, that actually, I think leads to another point that, that he had made, which is that right now buyers just aren't demanding, you know, to speak to a certified sales professional, right? Uh, right. You know, so that was, that's something that has to be overcome. We have to figure out whether or not, you know, if it's critical that salesperson has project management skills, right? Uh, is that critical to a buyer? And most of the time it's not because those roles are split up within the organization. So we can kind of, we, we can see where there might be a little bit of friction here, uh, for, you know, at least in the B2B sense of the market uh, and B2B sales professionals. So I, I haven't heard of a situation where somebody wants to talk to a certified sales professional, mainly it, it may be because they're, uh, they're not aware of something like that or it just hasn't really come up, right? Yeah. yeah, I don't know that buyers know that that even exists. Well, the other the other piece of it was that it really understanding what are what does the sales the customer want? If they are, he was. I asked him, did he see AI as replacing the sales professional, artificial intelligence? And he thought, you know, when it comes to the level of basic commodity type products. Yes. You know, if I'm buying something online and want shoes and I can talk to AI and it really will solve the problems I need, am I okay with that? Probably so. But he said when you get the 
multi-stage, multi-level interactions where you have a team of what, 5.5 people in the customer, and then you've got your team and they all have to work together. We're probably a few years off before that becomes a, a challenge and we're going to lose it. But I, I, I thought he gave a good thoughtful answer in that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the interesting thing is so many people get into sales and they don't plan on getting into sales. Very few people go to college and think, I'm going to be a sales professional someday. Yet, for whatever reason, a lot of us end up in a sales job after college. Yet, nobody goes, gets a certification or goes to school to figure out how do I actually become a professional salesperson. So I think it's really interesting to think about what if we really, really studied our craft the same way somebody would to become a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, a CPA, whatever that is. I mean, the income potential is huge when you're really, really that adept at your skill. So uh, it got me excited about what's possible. There are only, you know, like a couple schools out there uh, at uh, you know, a couple universities that actually offer sales bachelor's degrees or, or uh, sales certification, but usually that falls under marketing. And actually, uh, in some research I was doing, most marketers uh, actually end up coming up through sales. And most uh, people, if they're going to, you know, take and, and make a life of it in, in corporate, um, you know, in corporate America, do end up coming up through sales, or if they come up through a customer support uh, position, they have to start somewhere, usually it's towards the bottom. Uh, a lot of marketers end up coming out of the sales department because they need to have that frontline experience. It's just that sales hasn't been given really that, that level of credibility because it's seen almost to a degree, not all positions. I'm not, don't, don't everyone start hating me on Twitter now, but um, it is, you know, it's, it's the entry, it's the entry level. It's the entry gateway uh, into the rest of the other departments within the organization. And it's the most, to me, the most important job because the, the revenue driver, you know, with the least support. So, of course, one thing to me is it, it verified our joint projects on creating some real online training with a certificate on it that we're doing, right. that things that would give somebody, yes, I went through a social selling certificate program and stuff, right. at least offering that and the importance of maybe salespeople looking for what's on the customer's radar that would be important to them or employers. So it was really good. I think I'm glad you all enjoyed it as well. Yeah. I, I'm a, a great fan of uh, Brian and I seen him as a mentor and it, he's been a very kind advisor. So we're hoping you'll give more advice with us, but it was a really great experience. Maybe we'll get him back on the show too. So we'll have to come up with other questions. Yeah. Over to you to wrap it up. All right. Well, uh, again, thank you very much for listening to this uh, special episode, episode number 93 of the Social Selling Podcast by Linking Into Sales. Don't forget, you can take and subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, don't, uh, follow us on Twitter, on Google+, Plus, on LinkedIn, on wherever. Well, we got Facebook, too. Can't forget about yeah, Facebook. Yeah, we got YouTube. Yep, of course, don't forget about YouTube. We'll mention that one more time. Three times. Let's do it. And don't forget how about YouTube. Our training YouTube. Site. <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> and then don't forget, you can always get uh, training from us on, at socialselling.training. Uh, we have two absolutely free courses out there for to help you with creating a customer-facing LinkedIn uh, and customer-facing Twitter profiles. And we're going to, in reverse, thank our sponsors today at NC State Technology Training Solutions. And how can they learn more about that great training that they have to offer, including our social selling training, my my uh, social media management, and much more. Yep, absolutely. So if you want to learn more about uh, Martin's social media management course, which is a 10-week course. 12. 12-week uh, 12 course, sorry. Extra two weeks in there for free. Then, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Then, uh, or if you'd like to uh, learn more about our social, uh, social selling with LinkedIn course, or even how to get your digital marketing uh, certificate by That's chance, right. we have, uh, they have a, a course uh, plan out for that. Uh, definitely go out to linkingintosales.com slash N-C-S-U-T-T-S. I'm going to come up with a good jingle for that. Like, That's right. Let's do that another time. N-C-S-U-T-T-S. <laughs> so, all right. Oh, all right. wait, 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 wait. Go ahead. Sing, sing it. We got a jiggle there. Go ahead. <laughs> You guys don't that again. He's better dancer than the two of us put together. Oh, so gosh, it's just a couple. Of yeah, there we go. You can't see it. For those listening, just imagine the brilliant and glamorous don't. Elise was yeah. dancing for her. Don't. Don't. <laughs> you can throw things at me when you're back in town, Elise. I will. Don't worry. I'll be thinking of what to throw. I'll watch. What <laughs> yeah. So. Great. Great. Good show. Thanks again, folks, and look forward to your comments below.